Okay. All right. I, hopefully this is working. We're videotaping this. Um, we might close that door later, but we'll let, give a chance for people to come in. So this is the, the crossword Bible study here at St. Gall. And this is the uh, Psalms study. So we just named this, or I named it, uh, our powerful prayer book. I'm kind of using the, this book as my main book. It, you don't have to buy it. It's a small book. It's called uh, Psalm Basics for Catholics by John Bergsma. But um, it's not that you have to buy. The big thing we're going to be doing is reading Scripture, reading the Psalms. Okay, so um, uh, is he, a priest he is a theologian. Yes, he's a very good theologian. Uh, John Berg's my Catholic theologian. Um, so let's just start with uh, let's start with a prayer. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, for the chance for us all to gather together. We ask you to help us with your Holy Spirit to be able to hear your voice in these psalms as we pray them, study them, read them. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to know what you're calling us to do and give us the grace to respond. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is, uh, this is the introduction uh, session, okay? So in a way, I, this might end up being, I, I hope it's not going to be boring. I'm going to try to have it not be boring, but it's kind of the nuts and bolts stuff that is good to do when we start a study on any kind of Bible study. So the other sessions that we're going to go looking at, we're going to be, we'll be looking at some Psalms tonight, but um, we'll be going more in depth with Psalms on the other sessions. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, so first what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of go by the who, what, why, when, and how of the Psalms, the basics. Uh, then we're going to kind of uh, go through uh, something a little bit about um, how the Psalms fit into the story of salvation history, the, o the overall story of the, of the Bible. And we're going to talk about the person of David. Um, we're going to look at how the Psalms tell a, an overall story. Um, and then uh, finally, we're going to look at Psalms 1 and 2 is my goal, because uh, those two Psalms are actually like, a, they're like an introduction to the, the, the book of Psalms. So they're very unique Psalms. So we're going to try and look at those before the end of the night. So the book of Psalms is, as you guys all know, it is the greatest, most popular book of poetry ever known to mankind, right? It's, um, in fact, the Church Fathers said that in the Psalms is a whole summary of uh, salvation history. It's a, it's a summary of the Old Testament. And in fact, they even said it's a, it's a whole summary of a divine revelation. And the early uh, Church Fathers said that uh, the Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms is also like a, a prophecy of Christ and the church, that everything could kind of in a way be seen in the Psalms. And um, another thing about the Psalms, which is great, is every state of the soul in the presence of God is on display in the Psalms, right? Like you, you get, if you're joyful, you find that in the Psalms. If you're thankful, you find that in the Psalms. If you are angry, you find, like really angry, you find that in the Psalms. If you're scared, you find that in the Psalms. If you are kind of like groaning and, you know, frustrated and calling out to God, that is in the Psalms. Uh, love is in the Psalms. Uh, joy, everything. Which is kind of interesting because it shows you that, like, you know, every human emotion is part of our natural experience and all those things can be taken up into prayer. It's not like you only can pray to God when you're like, happy. Can you imagine if you could only pray to God when you were happy? It'd be kind of weird, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorrow, contrition. Psalm 51, we're going to look at Psalm 51. That's one of the, my favorite uh, psalms of contrition, sorrow for sin. But every, all the whole gamut of emotion, of human emotion, is found in the book of the Psalms. So that we're going to be looking at that. Um, and also, I always love this fact. The Psalms is... Like if you said to yourself, like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to, what to say to God. Well, boom, open up the Bible about halfway through and you have a whole bunch of prayers you can say, right? The Psalms are God's inspired word that he gives us first when he, he communicates to us in the Psalms. If we hear them read out loud, and we're going to talk about the different ways we pray with the Psalms, um, we can hear his voice when we hear the Psalms. And then we can speak back to him 
with the Psalms, with his inspired words. You know, we can pray. Um, even Jesus, Jesus prayed the Psalms, right? Like Jesus, who is God made man, prayed the Psalms and, and prayed them to the Father. And it's kind of amazing to think. Um, okay, so uh, Psalms, in, in short, what is a Psalm? A Psalm is a uh, poem sung to music from a stringed instrument. That's how it originally was. It was uh, the lyre, which would have been kind of like um, a harp, an ancient form of a harp. So it would be sung uh, to a plucked instrument, uh, a poem that was sung uh, in worship. Or it could have been, uh, it was either for, used for worship or instruction, something like that, especially for worship in the temple. That's what the Psalms were. Um, where do we get, this, this is just important stuff to kind of think about. Where do we get the word Psalm? Does anyone know what language that that comes from? Greek. Greek. Oh, who said Greek? All right, Rick. All right. Way to lead off. That's the first base hit of the, of the, of the season. Okay. Uh, Psalms. Um, I think it was Psalmoi was like the Greek. Because remember, the, the, the Psalms were written in Hebrew, right? But then they were eventually translated into Greek. Uh, because remember, a lot of the Jews uh, moved out and into the diaspora. And they lived in Greek-speaking areas, so they had to have uh, scriptures that they could uh, use. So they had a Greek translation. Um, the Jews called these uh, the Telahim, which translates as the praises. The praises. Um, and then even the word, if you ever hear the word Psalter, um, the Psalter is another word for the book of the Psalms. Uh, and it actually comes from psalterion in Greek, which was a word for a stringed instrument. So that's where we get the word psalter for. So if, I, if you refer to the psalter, it's a shorthand way of saying the book of the Psalms, all the Psalms, the psalter. Okay. It's not what you like season your food with, like the psalter. Okay, that's cheesy. Okay, so how about the why? Why were Psalms created? Why were the Psalms written? They were written for prayer, worship, or instruction, basically. And this is, I want you to go to your handout, and if anyone's watching this video, you can get the handout. You can email me. I'm going to throw my email up there for anybody who's... F-R-D-I-T-O-M-O -O at St. Gall. Dot com. That's my email. You can email me and I'll send you these uh, handouts. So this purple handout has all the genres of the psalms. Okay, It's kind of good to think about and say, hey, what, what kind of different psalms are there? So one kind of psalm is l lament psalms. Okay, um, And if you've you got your Bible open, crack it open in, the, in half to the middle. And um, we're just going to look at some of these real quick just so you get an idea. A good lament psalm would be like, let's say, Psalm uh, 10. Psalm 10, here's a good example. So the lament, uh, lament psalms are basically where the person is suffering, right? And they're calling out to God to help them, to deliver them. And then in, this, in the midst of this, they're also doing other things. Like sometimes they're saying, okay, and, and, and please bring your justice down upon the evil ones. You know, vindicate me and deliver me. But there's also expressions of confidence that like God will do this. Um, so in Psalm 10, you sort of see um, verse 2, for example, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. So like, okay, there's arrogant people who are persecuting the poor. And then he says, let them be caught in the schemes which they have devised. Um, so you see kind of like um, where he's just sort of complaining. He's lamenting about, about evil in the world. And he's crying out to God to do something about it. To, sometimes it's, it's the person suffering a disease. Sometimes it's a persecution from an enemy. Um, sometimes it's um, a false accusation. Sometimes it's all of these things rolled into one. Okay? Uh, David is going to have some of these lament psalms. And sometimes the, the laments are individual laments, like by David, and sometimes they're communal laments, like the people lamenting together. Okay, so I give you some examples on that purple sheet, you know, if you want to look. Psalm 22 is, is one we're going to look at a lot. That's a famous one, right? Because 
That's the one where Jesus from the cross will pray this psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a, is that not a lament, right? And we, but we'll look at this psalm because um, this is a very a beautiful psalm and it, there's a lot going on in this psalm. So we'll be looking at that later too. Um, Thanksgiving psalms is the next category or todah, todah psalms. And this is where a person is giving, the, the, psalm, the, the psalmist is giving thanks to God for a specific action that God did to save this person in their life. Like maybe they were being you know, pursued by somebody and God delivered them and they just say, I want to thank God and I'm going to offer a sacrifice and then I'm going, to inv- I'm going to offer the sacrifice and then I'm going to eat this meal and I'm going to invite all my friends over and I'm going to tell everybody what God did to save me. And the whole thing is going to be done in the spirit of thanksgiving. Uh, so a good Todah psalm, probably one of the ones I always think of is 116. If you flip many pages to 116, you'll kind of see little features. Um, see if I can find something. In verse 3 it says, The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol, that's the, the underworld, that's the, the domain of the dead. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. And um, then verse 8, he says, For you have delivered my soul from death. So God delivered him from that that, um, situation. Uh, And then he says, in verse 12, What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? So like, what should I give back to God for having saved me? And he says in verse 13, I will lift up the chalice of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. Um, so there's, there's an idea. Verse 17, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. That's a, a perfect uh, Todah psalm. What does that psalm also make, make you think of? Does it make you think of anything else? Eucharist. Yes. This is a psalm that I actually had on the back of my, or one of my ordination cards when I got ordained a priest. It's, it's really clearly seen as um, Eucharistic, right, and the priesthood because you are offering, uh, let me lift up the chalice of salvation and call on the name of the Lord and offer a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So uh, that's a beautiful Todah psalm. Then we have uh, things called, well, they're just hymns. These are more like thanking God in, in general for God's general goodness, you know, his, his goodness seen in creation, um, and, and, and in the law and everything. It's just God is good, and they're just more general hymns uh, of thanking God. Um, sometimes they're just they're saying how, God, how good God is. Sometimes the psalm is in the form of, of somebody basically saying, telling everybody to praise God and thank God for, for how good he is. Uh, so another example here would be like Psalm 65. Psalm 65, um, if you read, so, it, it, some subtitles say Thanksgiving for Earth's Bounty, um, but it's just, it's thanking God for the bounty of the earth. There's a lot, of, a lot in here about uh, creation, um, and so, uh, so you can see that's a good example of a, of a hymn. Then we have the royal psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 2 later. If you want, you can turn to it right now. But um, the royal psalms are psalms that glorify the king, who is the son of David. Or they praise God for putting the king in place. Or they offer petitions for the welfare of the king. So those are the royal psalms. Um, Good examples are uh, Psalm 72. Like I said, we're going to Psalm 89. We're going to look at Psalm 2 later today. Um, then we have Mount Zion Psalms. So the Mount Zion Psalms. Zion is Jerusalem. So if you ever heard, does anyone not know that, or did anyone, did anyone know that? No. Okay, it's okay if you didn't know it. I mean, Zion. It's something you'll hear. You've heard that, right? Sure. Zion. Um, it's, in fact, it's even used today. People will talk about um, Zionism and stuff, which has to do with you know Jerusalem and the, the state of Israel and, and certain cultural movements or whatever. But basically, Zion, Mount Zion is another word for Jerusalem uh, in Scripture. 
And so the Mount Zion Psalms basically are praising, glorifying Zion or Jerusalem because it's the royal capital of the Davidic kingdom. It's the place where the temple is. And um, so that we're going to also see, these are also a lot of times related to the royal Psalms because that's where the king lives, right, in Zion. So they, those, those two are kind of connected. Then we have the last main category is the wisdom or Torah Psalms. And we're going to look at Psalm 1 today. Uh, but the, these are the psalms that give glory to God for God's law as a sound guide to living life. Um, so Psalm 1 uh, is a good example. Psalm 19 uh, is a good example. Um, and then, uh, okay, so, so some other forms uh, we're going to talk about, uh, just well, just briefly. I'm going to talk about acrostics, what that is later. That's a, that's a literary form. Uh, there is Psalms of Confidence, which just show expressions of trust in God in a general way. Um, I have some of those listed. There, oh, there is the imprecatory Psalms, which are the cursing Psalms. Okay, So we're not going to go into those. If you want to look at an example of one, um, Psalms 69 and 109 would be... Uh, 69 and 109 would be imprecatory or cursing Psalms. Um, Hey, you know, it's part of the human emotion. You're angry at somebody, at an enemy, and you wish them ill, right? It's sort of, these are kind of, you know, embarrassing uh, in some ways to some people, you know? Uh, like, oh, why is this, this is in the, the scriptures. But I think it's, it's, just, it's just interesting that that's part of the God's inspired word, too, because it captures something about um, raw, you know, human emotion. Um, it also kind of makes us understand mercy in a little different way. But we're not going to do a lot of looking at the imprecatory psalms. But, okay. Um, there's didactic psalms, which are kind of instructional. Uh, psalms of ascent were psalms that pilgrims sang when they were going up on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, climbing up to Jerusalem. They would sing psalms of ascent. And then finally, the messianic psalms. Basically, the messianic psalms are the psalms that uh, prophesy or foreshadow the coming of Christ, the Messiah. And most of the royal psalms are messianic psalms. But also we're going to see Psalm 22, which is, a, which is a lament, is also a messianic psalm because we're going to see Jesus, of course, foreshadowed there. Um, and um, some of these, there's some genres get mixed. For example, Psalm 22 is kind of like a, it goes from being a lament to a todah. It sort of a, has the whole thing in there. Um, we'll talk, 20, Psalm 22 is one of the most important psalms. We'll definitely be talking about that and going, in, and going into, the, into the kind of the greater depths of that. So who, uh, who wrote the psalms? Who, who can answer that question? Who wrote the psalms? David, David right? Okay. Um, most, most contemporary scholars today, I mean, you might find somebody who just says, they're all by David, but I mean... If you really study the book of Psalms, it wouldn't appear to be the case. Um, probably about half of them were written by David. Um, others, though, you have some other authors. Like, and you'll see this in these headings, right? right? Like Psalm uh, 20, I'm just looking at that. That's what my Bible's opened up to. It says, a prayer for victory to the choir master, a psalm of David. So that's attributed to David. But there's other ones, um, like, for example, Psalm... Uh, we have the sons of Korah, and that was a, a group, a clan of, of Levites who were gatekeepers in the, uh, in the temple, and David established them, and they sang some of the psalms and composed some. Two of the members were Henan and Ethan, so Psalm 88 and 89. If you take a look at those, see if they say Psalm 88 and 89. What does it say for the author of Psalm 88? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, there's... Mine shows... Yes. A song. A psalm of the sons of Korah. Yeah. To the choir master, according to the Mahalath Lenoth. And I'm not sure about that. I do not know Hebrew, okay? So if I sound like I do, it's because I'm faking. faking okay? 
a, a masculine of Heman the Ezraite. So there's Heman, okay? Well, this, is, this says it was Heman, but he was part of the um, Sons of Korah, okay? It's kind of like when you're in a band and then you go on a solo, you do a solo, you know, okay. project. Okay, Rick knows what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Asaph also was a choir leader. David appointed. He did about 12 psalms. Uh, Psalm 72 and 127. Let's see what 72 says. Who's that one attributed to? Who's Psalm 72 attributed to? Solomon. Solomon of Solomon. Okay. And also I think 127. Um, some people say that Psalm 72 is about Solomon. It's not by him. You know, of Solomon could mean it's, it's about him. Um, but, but scholars would say that 127 is, is about him or is by him most likely. Um, Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses, okay, who lived quite a lot before. Um, I think s Moses. Moses. Yeah. Um, and I think it says that, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Um, some Psalms were probably anonymous. So the point is they were um, largely written by David or people who were in the Davidic tradition and admi later admirers of David, right? Um, they, 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 they were written over a course of period, a, a period of time. So uh, some at the time of David, some after, um, you know, years later, centuries later when they were in exile and came back. So there's actually a time span uh, which the, the Psalms could have been written between um, 1,000 and 400 B.C., some people say. So we're going to be looking at, uh, and then they would have later been brought together in a collection. Um, Okay, how were they written? So what can we say about how um, the Psalms were written? Well, they were written, for, first of all, in Hebrew, right? That's obvious. And some of the Psalms are acrostics. An acrostic is where each verse begins with the next letter of the alphabet. And this is in Hebrew. So you're, in an English translation, you're not going to see that, okay? Um, so it would be kind of like if we did an acrostic, it would be like a poem that would be like, Apple, blah, 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 and then B would be banana, which just sounds like a great poem, doesn't it, so far? But, um, so in Hebrew, I can't, we, cannot, we can't see it in English, but uh, certain psalms, like Psalms 9 and 10, 25 and 34, they are acrostics. So that's just like a, a little style that they wrote it in. So the psalms are poetry. They're not prose. They're poetry, but they don't have, like, English poetry rhymes, or a lot of times it rhymes. It doesn't have to rhyme, but it, that is a feature sometimes of English poetry. Um, the psalms did not have that. But they did have a sense of rhythm, and I'm going to just go through a couple of little features that you'll see when you look at the psalms. In fact, if you want to kind of look at, let's, and we're not going to be flipping through the psalms like the whole series. This is just the first night because we're looking at a bunch of different different things. But why don't you go to Psalm 2, flip all the way to the front. Um, this is a common feature. Like, how does it start off? Who wants to read Psalm 2, verse 1? Debbie? Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Okay, so there you go. Um, there is, this is called parallelism. Parallelism. There's two parallel. There's two parallel lines that they they say. Uh, in this case, they say something of the same meaning. You know, they're saying the same thing in two different ways. Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? Conspiring and plotting is the same thing. Um, you'll see. We will see this throughout the Psalms. Um, sometimes uh, look at uh, look right above there at Psalm one verse six. Um, that's called, and that, I'm, I'm just giving you this, this is not stuff you need to write down or it's kind of like just technical stuff, but that's called um, synonymous parallelism because they're synonyms, it's the same thing. But then there's also antithetical parallelism where you have opposites. So like um, Psalm 1 verse 6, who wants to read verse 6 of Psalm 1? The Lord, the Lord Go ahead. Watches. Okay, so again, there's parallelism, same ideas, but they're the opposite. So my translation says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So talking, one thing's talking about the, the righteous, one thing's talking about the wicked. Um, 
And then there's also uh, other kinds of parallelism where they kind of uh, each line builds on another or expands another. Um, sometimes you'll even have um, uh, those little two lines are called um, uh, bicola, uh, but sometimes you'll actually have a uh, tricola, which is three. So look in Psalm 1, um, verse 1. Who wants to read that? Okay, there you go for it. Okay, good. That's a really unique one. Um, blessed is the man who, who walks. And actually, it starts with a one little thing by itself. Blessed is the man. Then it goes, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. There's a, there's a triple. It's like a, it's a little bit more um, solemn. You know, it's a little bit gets your attention. So that's some of the little parallelism is some of the stuff we're going to see. Um, now we're going to talk about how the Psalms fit into the story of salvation history. So um, one of the things we did in the last year's Bible study, and I know not everyone was here, but we talked about salvation history as a series of covenants, which a covenant is basically a, a family bond that God makes. Well, a covenant in general is a family bond that you make with another person and you, you seal it with an oath. And God in salvation history made covenants with his people. So Let's just do a little review, a little crash course review. What was the first covenant? Who was the first covenant with? Adam. Adam. Okay. So it's sometimes called the Adamic, which is a really weird, weird, world, weird word, the Adamic covenant, but it's the covenant with Adam. Then it was, and that was, you know, with the covenant with, uh, of creation, God with this first couple, Adam and Eve. And of course, each covenant sort of came with a fall, right? We, there was the fall with this one, right? Um, what was the next uh, covenant? Noah. Noah, right? Okay, God um, saving Noah and his family. Then Noah had a, had a fall of his own again. After that, who was the next covenant with? Abraham, Abraham right? And then, you know, and what are the, some of the things that God promised Abraham? He called him and he said, I'm going to give you some stuff. What am I going to give you? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, descendants. You know, it would start with one child, but it would be eventually many, right? Like many descendants. What was the other thing? This is Genesis 12. The land. And this one's a little harder to remember, but he said that, his family would be the source of a universal blessing for all the, all the people. Okay. He said, like, I will give you a name and descendants. Okay. And, uh, but then there was the covenant, like, you know, there was uh, circumcision. There was the sacrifices he offered. But then, remember, on, on, uh, on Mount, these are actually all happened, by the way, on mountains. On Mount Moriah, what happened on Mount Moriah that Abraham did? Right, he was going to offer up his son, right, Isaac. But God said, you know, don't spare, you know, it was the willingness to offer back the son. Um, um, so all of these, Noah is Mount Ararat, which is hard to say, and I'm sure not how you actually say it. Um, okay, and then um, uh, the creation, Mount Eden, as scholars will sometimes say that Eden... Was a mount, it was like it was like an elevated area. Um, okay, four. What was the next covenant? Notice how these keep getting bigger and bigger and expanding, right? What was the the next covenant? Moses, right? And that was like the law, right? That was the main thing was Sinai, Mount Sinai. Remember that was the reading we had this this past Sunday. What God is so close to His people that he has given them their law, given, given them his law, right? That was, um, what was that first reading from? That was from uh, Deuteronomy. Yeah. And remember, it, it just talks about how, how awesome it was that God gave the law. That was a beautiful example of the, the, um, the, Mo the Mosaic covenant. And after that, the next covenant is where we're at with, these, with this study. David. The Davidic covenant. 
which I think is 2 Samuel 7, if I'm not mistaken. We're, we're going to look at that later. Where God says, I will make you uh, a house. You know, he wants to build a temple for God and for the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And he says, you want to build a house for me? I'm going to give you a house. I'm going to make you this family that, that, that's going to be, um, and, and your, your descendants will always be uh, kings. And then, a lot of stuff happened after that, right? Remember how they went into exile? Well, first of all, you had the bad kings. We'll talk a little bit about that with Solomon. Uh, David's, uh, David's son, Solomon, had a good start, but he was not a really great, great king. So he, uh, eventually they divided southern kingdom, northern kingdom, Judah and, and Israel. And then they, uh, the prophets kind of were, were starting to visit them, calling them to be faithful, um, but they weren't being faithful. They were breaking the covenant. They were falling back into idolatry. And eventually, uh, first the northern kingdom was invaded and taken into exile by Assyria. And then finally, the southern kingdom, Judah, the Jews, were, ta- were invaded by the Babylonian Empire. Temple was destroyed. No more king. Okay, That's why on your sheet you're going to see, well, we'll talk about this too. You're going to see the king fall down and lose his crown. Okay, So we'll talk about that. Um, and then so they pro- the prophet said, look, there's going to be a new covenant. There's going to be this new, this time when like um, God will put his spirit in, in, he'll give the people a new heart and there's going to be a new Davidic king. Um, and so that brought us to number six, which is Jesus is the new covenant, right? Okay. And um, David, David's covenant is on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, which, by the way, is also where this, this is going to be, right? Where, G, where does Jesus die on the cross? In Jerusalem, right? So, you know, so, okay. There's a little, like, that's just a little salvation history real quick, you know, a little summary. Um, but Jesus, as the Eucharistic covenant, uh, this is important, he... Jesus came as the son of David. And at the Last Supper, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, right? And so by eating his body, drinking his blood, we enter into a family relationship with God. That's part of the fulfillment of the new covenant uh, through Christ. And he also, uh, Jesus had this, this kingdom, the new kingdom of David, and he, he shared the authority with the apostles. This is an interesting verse you might want to look at. Luke 22, um, 29 to 30. Jesus says to the apostles, um, As my Father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you, that you may eat at my table in my kingdom and sit on my thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So right before the Last Supper, he's basically saying, I'm gonna, the Father has given me a kingdom and I'm going to give it to you. They're going to be part of the kingdom. Um, these are, there's things in the Old Testament, uh, like who is,